uh, session number seven. Uh, as all of you know today, uh, we have a, a guest lecture delivered by Professor Penan Avanichai at AIT. Uh, Professor Penan will discuss about recent research studies at AIT in earthquake engineering, vibration control, and structural health monitoring. Uh, during the lecture, Professor Penan will be presenting many applications of uh, knowledge in a structural dynamics to solve a real structural engineering problem. I think I have already shared with you uh, Professor's uh, present presentation slides. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Professor Penan for accepting my invitation and taking time for uh, to deliver this lecture. I know, sir, you are extremely busy, and especially the uh, the exam time and the uh, the sometimes the thesis review time in the AIT. So now I would like to introduce Professor Penan. Uh, he was one of my master's uh, lecturer, which was between 1992 and 1994. Uh, some of you may have not been born then, <laughs> that time. Uh, uh, Professor taught me uh, first on a wind effect on structures the subject uh, in our AIT first term, where I started uh, learning on uh, structural dynamics. He was the one of the best uh, lecturers we had. I had the privilege of studying at AIT. I'm always grateful to that one. Uh, if I may introduce you uh, formally, uh, Professor Pennan obtained his uh, a Doctor of Engineering degree in Civil Engineering from University of Tokyo, uh, Japan, and he's currently the Professor in Structural Engineering Field of Study School of Engineering and Technology, Asian Institute of Technology, uh, Bangkok, Thailand. I think uh, many of you uh, know AIT, many Sri Lankan and uh, all over the place, uh, engineers uh, spread across like me, uh, studied in AIT. Uh, Professor Pennan uh, is actually involved in uh, disaster preparedness and mitigation management field of studies in AIT. I think he has been quite well known in, in the region. Uh, beside Professor's uh, association with the AIT, he, he has been part of various uh, significant uh, elective appointment, appointed officers in both in Thailand as well as uh, the region and around the world. Some of the Professor Penn and current professional applications are a scientific board member, the Global Earthquake Model Member, National Earthquake Committee of Thailand, chair, a chapter on the effect of earthquakes and wind loads, Engineering Institute of Thailand under uh, His Majesty the King Patronage, Member Civil Engineering Chapter, Engineering Institute of Thailand under His Majesty the uh, King's Patronage. <clears throat> the Professor Penan has a considerable experience in conducting research projects and uh, so many uh, fronts. Uh, his area of uh, seismic uh, hazard and risk assessment, some of the notable research project uh, Professor Penan has concluded the seismic hazard and risk assessment of six cities in Bangladesh, action plan for earthquake disaster prevention and mitigation in Bangkok, a study on seismic design and retrofit of buildings in Thailand. The research and consulting assignment conducted by Professor Penan covers uh, nationally as well as the, the region, South Asia and Southeast Asia. In, in addition to uh, Professor Penan's involvement in academia and the project assignment and so many other work, he has also been involved in the uh, conducting post-disaster field visits to get the first-hand information and experience about the destruction and the understand the vulnerability of the communities when we subjected to when the, when the, when we were subjected to this unforeseen. Uh, uh, environmental impact of XD. The most, uh, one of the most recent visit by Professor is the, all of you know, the massive earthquake in Nepal, a Goka earthquake. Yeah. And uh, 
Professor Fennan has a lot of publication and he is involved. Uh, he's published papers, journals, book chapters, and monograph and development projects. Yeah, so many things. Professor Fennan recently co authored the papers on vulnerability of type, typhoon hazard in coastal informal settlement of Metro Manila, Philippines, as well. So uh, if I go on, I can talk about Professor for, <laughs> for hours. So the today purpose is to listen to him as much as possible. Uh, before I handing over to uh, Professor and my <clears throat> teacher. Uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry, <clears throat> I must say this. Uh, <clears throat> you in the audience are <clears throat> But today, very lucky to get an <clears throat> very rare opportunity to listen to a person of uh, Professor Penny and Caliber. Uh, I would like you to uh, to make use of this opportunity, actively participate. If you have any questions, uh, please ask during the Q and A session. Uh, please message to the uh, 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 chat so then we can direct that one to Professor. Sir, may I hand over? to you to uh, start the lecture. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Roita. Thank you for your kind uh, introduction. Um, actually, I, I, I was expecting a, a shorter introduction. It will be enough. Um, I, I like to inform all the audience that actually when uh, Rohita first asked me to give a talk, he actually want me to demonstrate or show some applications of the knowledge in structure dynamics to practical to solve practical problems. Well, I I was after thinking for some time, I come up with this topic issue because at AIT I'm a professor and working with master and doctoral students all the time. So our main job is to do research. So I come up with uh, showing, demonstrating our research work, mostly uh, the work of my, of my students that are related to practical issues. So I'm, I'm focusing on just a few topics, earthquake engineering, vibration control, and structural health mon uh, monitoring. I understand that most of you are structural engineers, practicing structural engineers. So I actually designed a slide for that, for, for those background. So let, let, uh, let me start um, uh, by showing this slide. I hope you can all see this. It's a, a very tall steel stack. Actually, this is a real one in, um, in uh, Rayong. It's a province not far away from Bangkok the capital city of Bangkok, uh, the, the capital city of, of Thailand. Rayong is, uh, in Rayong, we have many in industrial complex. And this is one of the tallest steel stack in that area. Okay, you can see that the structure is tall. It's a vertical cantilever system. This type of structure is very flexible. The lateral stiffness is very low. And it can be easily shaken, shaken by dynamic wind effects. Well, just to explain how the wind can actually shake this structure, you have to look at the next slide, this one. You can think of this as a top view. And the yellow color circulars is, uh, show the section of the stack. The wind approaching from the left, and when it flow pass through the stack, it will create rotational flow we call vortex. And this process is called vortex shading. You know, the vortex shading is actually, it will produce periodic vortex, upper, lower, and upper in a cyclic manner. This will actually produce cyclic change of wind pressure around the stack. The, the, if you sum all this pressure, you get the resulting force 
shown by the orange or the red color arrow. You see that this cyclic, I mean, periodic vortex chaining will create kind of periodic checking force to this structure. This periodic checking force has a certain frequency. When this frequency match with the natural frequency of the structure, it will shake the structure. The, and the, it will produce a large lateral response, lateral vibration to this structure. It will produce large cyclic bending moment to the structure and high cyclic stress. And sometimes this cyclic stress lead to fatigue failure, especially near the base of the structure. So actually we, as a structure engineer, we want to make sure that the structure is safe. We want to keep the stress low. We want to keep the amplitude low, okay? And there are, there are many possible ways to do that. <clears throat> uh, one way is quite popular, it's called aerodynamic approach, is to, to modify the exterior geometry of the structure. This is example, okay? We, we, wrap around the top part of the stack by helical strike. This will actually modify the vortex shading flow around the top part of, of, of the stack. It will reduce the shaking force by the vortex shading. Okay. Now this, this approach actually has been checked in a lab using a scale model in wind tunnel. And we found that it's, it was very effective. It can entirely suppress the vortex induced vibration. But when it comes to the full scale structure, there are several reports. Some reports say that it works well. Some reports say that it doesn't work at all. So I, I'm not sure which one I should believe. But anyway, this, this approach has been widely applied to the real structure. The, this, the second example is a different approach. You have a slender vertical structure with a low lateral stiffness. Our structural engineering, engineering approach is to stiffening them. So you can see the stiffening truss around the slender stack, okay? This is also effective, but definitely quite expensive because you have to construct stiff, uh, stiffening truss around uh, the structure. The approach I want to highlight is a structure dynamic approach. Uh, it's actually, we, we have a device called June mass damper installed onto this structure. From the distance, you cannot see that. But if you take a close look at the top, I hope you can see the mouse. Huh? Can you see the mouse? Okay. I, yes, sir, we can see, yes. Okay, good. I, I can use as a pointer. So on the top part, you, this, is a, this is a picture. You can see the, the blue color steel ring. That is a June mass damper. That's a part of June mass damper. From the distance, you, you cannot, almost cannot see it. This June mass damper has a, a simple configuration. It's actually made from large steel ring. And this steel ring is hang from a stack by wire ropes. It's hang at three locations. So there are three wire ropes, making this become pendulum. So the ring can swing relative to the stack in any direction, okay? Um, this is a picture. And, and at the base of the ring, we attach viscous damper is a container filled with a viscous liquid. And uh, the base of the viscous damper is attached to the stack. So this is a simple pendulum style June mass damper. Okay, we call this June mass damper because it will work only when you tune the frequency of the pendulum to the frequency of the stack. Okay, the, the, the stack has its own natural frequency. So we need to tune this pendulum frequency to match with the frequency of the stack. Then there will be a resonance effect between them, between the pendulum and the stack. 
vibration energy from the stack will flow into the pendulum system. Vibration energy of the pendulum will be dissipated by viscous damper. So by this way, we can increase energy dissipation of the entire system. This is a concept. Okay. Um, and it's worked very well for stack. But the idea is not just limited to, to steel stack. It can be applied to other structure. This is a tall building example. I picked this example because it's a, a very famous building. The name is Taipei 101. If you visit Taipei city, you, you must see this one. It is uh, the tallest building in Taipei. And if you go up to the top, you will see this pendulum, this large pendulum near the top of the, the Taipei 101 building. Well, this is a, a huge pendulum. It made from a large size steel ball, uh, actually metal ball. The mass of this metal ball is about 700 ton. And the pendulum length, pendulum rope is about uh, ele uh, 11 meters long. It has to be this long pendulum because we need uh, the designer have to match pendulum frequency with the building frequency. Okay, then it will work as a tune mass damper. You can see the size of a, a person, a, a people. You, the, the, this is a size of a man standing near the pendulum. Oh, the pendulum is uh, very large, but it's quite effective to suppress the wind-induced vibration. And also, I think, seismic as well, but mainly it's designed for wind effect. This shows the, the structure form of large pendulum. As a structure engineer, I think you can see how difficult it is to design the supporting system for a large pendulum of this size. Okay, the idea is simple, but to translate into action, this is a complex structure. You have to have a system that will carry a large weight at this, uh, under this tension rope. Well, it's a uh, complicated. Uh, at AAT, we are thinking of a different format form or configuration of tune mass damper, this form that will give uh, almost the same effect as the pendulum style TMD. But this is uh, what we call, it's, it's actually made from mass. It's a concrete mass putting on rubber bearing. In fact, it's a kind of a steel laminated rubber bearing. This uh, rubber bearing is quite stiff in, in vertical direction, but it's very soft in lateral direction because the shear modulus of, of rubber is, is very low. So when, when, when you arrange it this way, the mass can move laterally, but it's not moving in, in vertical direction. And when we put it into multi-stage, we can make this system very low frequency. So in this configuration, it is possible to design to mass damper with the last mass, several hundred ton or even a thousand ton, and make them really long natural period, low frequency, so that it can match with the building frequency. We can make it uh, very large, allow them to move laterally with a large displacement in elastic manner. It will occupy only small space, I mean, compared to the pendulum. Construction is simple. The maintenance requirement is low because you know this type of rubber bearing is used to support bridge, bridge structure. And it's, many of them are exposed to rain, sunlight, atmosphere directly. And it can continue to function for over many decades. But, but here in this application, we put it indoor. So it is very low maintenance requirement. And if we construct to mass sample this way, the cost will be low. If the cost is low, it means that maybe the solution will be practical. You can apply 
this type of structure of the tune mass sample to many of real projects. So we, we focus our attention to this type of configuration. So come back to this one. If we redesign the pendulum into the new format, it will be only this. It will occupy much less space. And then you can use the, this expensive space for some other purpose. Okay, the, the client, the building owner can uh, get back their space and then use them for some other function. Okay. Here is uh, a scaled down model of June Mass Damper that I'm talk talking about. It's a work of one master student at AT, Mr. Prut Jan Sukho in 2019. Actually, he actually construct this one, a two-ton mass, put on the multi-state rubber bearing, put on shake table. The shake table actually creating the lateral floor movement. It is to simulate the building motion. And here is a tune mass sample. You, you can see this. Well, the, we have a model of the building. So we calculate how the building moves under oh, turbulence. Be, be, be and we feed this as a, a randomly movement of the floor. OK. So his, his focus was to actually develop a mathematical model of this two math sample. So by putting accelerometer on acceleration sensor at the mass and at, at the floor, from these two information, we can develop accurate mathematical model of June mass damper. This is, this is a nonlinear model with some softening effect, but I don't want to go into details. Um, this is um, the work by one master student. And then the work is transferred to next student, Mr. Shannon. Chomani. And his assignment was to design full scale tune mass damper based on what we have learned from the work of Mr. Prick. So he designed actual the, the full size tune, tune mass damper of 1,000 ton using commercially available rubber bearing. So it's come up to be this size. And then he applied this kind of uh, uh, full-scale to mass sample to full-scale building of two, 200 meters tall. Of course, all these are numerical study, not, not the real one yet. Okay. So he has computer model of a 200 meter tall building. And he applied a to mass sample of 1,000 ton. 1,000 ton looks large, but it's only about less than 0.5% of the total building mass. So it's quite small compared to the size of, of the building. And this tune mass number is placed on the top. The natural frequency of the building is about 0.2 Hertz. And you can see the effectiveness of tune mass number by looking at the gray curve and black curve graph. This is a plot of the vibration on the top of the building presented in terms of horizontal acceleration time, time history. The gray color is a case without tune mass damper. And when we apply tune mass damper, it's turned into the black curve. So the response is random, but you can see that the average amplitude reduced. The black stay within the limit, acceptable limit presented by the blue color dash line, okay, about 50 millity. This is a limit to prevent motion sickness to building occupants, okay. So this is a show effectiveness in one direction. You call y axis acceleration, but you can also see effectiveness in two direction as well. This is a plot of x and y, like we are looking the motion from the top. The gray color is the case without damper. The green one is with June mass damper. 
So you can see that the June mass damper will effectively suppress the motion and make them stay within acceptable limits. Okay. Now we are planning to apply this to real structure. So we are working with some projects now, um, but I'm not sure when it will be implemented because we just finished the research. We are planning for a project of tall building in Pakistan, in um, Karachi. So we hope that we can actually apply this idea to the real, to design of real size to mass temper in the future. Now I change the subject to earthquake engineering after showing you the vibration control. Now let's see earthquake engineering. I think many countries are located in high seismic hazard area, but many of their buildings and structures are not actually designed for seismic resistance. This is example. This is a called commercial residential building. Okay. The first story is for commercial purpose. The upper story is for residential purpose. So this is, I think you can find this type of building almost everywhere in Asia. I took this picture from Thailand, but you can find similar buildings in Vietnam, in Sri Lanka, in Nepal, in China in many countries, maybe including Australia. Okay. But uh, one thing is in, is in common, most of them, or majority of them are not designed and construct for seismic resistance. So this building actually have many features that make them vulnerable to earthquake ground shaking. I can explain that. Um, if you take one example, you will see this kind of 3D building, the, the white part show the building frame, beam column frame system. It's made from reinforced concrete and the orange color represent wall panels. These are brick wall, or you may call masonry infill walls, okay? Made from brick. So this is a, a typical commercial residential RC building. In the first story, the front part that next close to the road, normally you don't have wall, you have opening for that. And inside the first floor, there's uh, not many walls except on two sides and on, and, and on the back. But in upper story, it's for residential. So people put many partitions to divide the space into many rooms. So there are exterior wall and interior walls. So upper story have many walls that contribute to the lateral stiffness. But the first story have lower stiffness, lower number of walls. So in this case, the building turned into soft story. In the first, they have a weak, soft and weak first story. The arrangement of wall also not symmetrical. So it will create torsional effect. So we call this torsional irregularity. The building frame, reinforced concrete, also the detailing of reinforcement are not made to make them ductile. This is, this is, this is quite typical for RC structure, not designed for earthquake. Okay. So when you have all these features, when it's subject to earthquake, it will look like this. The structure will sway. The upper part looks like a rigid body but the first story actually deform a lot, especially for the front row of the columns. So you, you don't have to be a structural engineer, you still can tell that the first row column, first story column will be the first element to be damaged. Okay, and that is quite true. When the first column, first row of columns in the first story damage, up to the level that it, it may collapse, the building may collapse in the first story. So this is an example. This is a real picture of a building damage caused by an earthquake called Chichi earthquake in Taiwan. I took all this picture by myself 
you, but you can see that this collapse in the first story. This building also, this one is actually the second story. The first story is here. This one also, this is a second story. The first story is here. So all of them collapse in the first story. I have taken more than the picture of more than 20, 30 buildings and all, all of them collapse in the same way. The earthquake happened in the night and it caused many casualties. And more, most of most are the people who are sleeping in the first floor and the building collapsed and crashed onto them. So from these lessons, you should not sleep in the first floor, okay? You should avoid that. You should sleep on the second floor or third floor. Well, this is um, the buildings, a similar type of failure in Nepal, in Kathmandu. Again, this is a second story. The first story is here. You can see the collapse. The, the columns is separate from the, the joint. You see, you see the fracture of steel bar completely break down. Okay. This is another example in Nepal as well. I took this picture when I visit Kathmandu after the, the great earthquake. The upper story looks fine. The building still looks good. The windows, no, no crack, no damage. But the first story column, you can see here, is a large picture. The condition of columns is this bad. Okay, it, it is not a column anymore. It cannot carry any vertical load. I think the, the vertical load, the gravity load is carried by some other elements, maybe by the brick wall. Okay, the building is standing, but who knows, it may collapse at, at any time. Okay, so when they come back from the survey of from the post earthquake investigation in Nepal, I also brought back many as built drawing of the typical buildings in Nepal. I give this problem to one student, Mr. Surat Tapa, a master student. Uh, he's a student from Nepal. I asked him to actually study this building and find a way to strengthen the building so that it will not fail under the earthquake, under any earthquake in Nepal. Okay, so he has to create a nonlinear finite element model of this building. He has to try many ways to modify this building and try many uh, retrofit options or strengthening options. But I asked him not to try, not to do, not to try fancy approach. Any retrofit approach has to be able to be uh, implemented by contractors in Nepal. And I asked him not to do too much. If too much, I mean, if he modify more than what he needs, I mean, we have to pay more. So we have to do a minimum modification. That is to reduce the cost to minimum. So under this constraint, I asked him to work on the system. So he spent several months making a model, checking the performance, and he come up with this proposal. I mean, uh, column jacketing, you know? We just cast the new column around the, the existing column, make it larger, okay? We put the reinforcement and we put concrete around existing column. He found that we don't need to jacket every column in the first floor, just the front and the back, that will be enough. We don't have to jacket up to the second floor, it just only first floor is good enough. Okay, so I think this is possible. It's possible to improve seismic re uh, resistance and he showed that by doing so, it will withstand any future earthquakes that we can expect in, in, in Nepal. 
So by this approach, we can strengthen existing building, okay, we call seismic retrofitting. And if you are going to build a new one, you can just make it like this. Ma making the column in the first floor a little bit larger. It will slightly cost more than normal, but the safety is much better, okay, under earthquake. Yeah, that's the uh, first example. And the second example, this is uh, another school building in Chiang Rai, Thailand. This building was damaged by a moderate earthquake, 6.3 magnitude in 2014. Well, you can see this building. Again, this is a soft story building. The first floor has no wall, just column. The same column continue, same size to a second floor, third floor, but on the second floor, third floor, we have many partition walls, okay? We have brick walls, um, parapet wall, partition walls. So that strengthened the lateral stiffness of the second floor and third floor, but the first floor, nothing, just a column. So the system is actually soft story. It's also torsional irregularity because we have kind of masonry wall on one side of on one side of, of the building. So make it twisting, not only soft, but also twist. When we look at this building after the earthquake, we found that column in the first story suffer severe damage. Okay, you can see the picture on the right showing the damage to the columns. Um, well, if it's a bit more than this, the, the column, the building might collapse. So this is a kind of a typical uh, school buildings in Thailand. We have many school buildings with soft story. The next slide show how we solve this problem. This is a seismic retrofit program for a soft story RC school building using a technique called buckling restraint brace. This is a black color steel brace we add into this soft story building. Okay, it's a collaboration work between AIT and Nanyang Technological University in Singapore and some other Thai universities, KMUTT and CMU. Anyway, this is a real example. We actually retrofit at this moment more than seven buildings in Northern Thailand by different techniques. This is one of them. What, what I want to show this, this a brace look like this. It looks like a simple steel brace, but it is not simple. Now, normal steel brace, when it's under tension, it can yield and it can plastically deform in tension. But under compression, it may be buckle, but this brace is a buckling restraint brace, so there will be no buckling. So the, the brace is actually can yield in both tension and compression. So under the cyclic response, when a building is subject to earthquake, the building will sway to this and to, to the front, to the back, to the left, to the right, it will create large deformation, both in tension and compression to this brace. And if it can yield both in tension and compression, the hysteretic energy absorption will be very large. So many Japanese researchers who work on this buckling resistant brace call this type of brace um, metallic damper, okay? is actually damping, dampen the vibration by using hysteretic behavior, okay? So I give this problem to one master student, Mr. Hassan Tariq in 2016 to design the buckling lesson brace for the system. We, and he found that we don't have to strengthen or modify any structure. We don't have to modify the foundation system. We just add, just a few breaths to the soft story and that will be good enough, okay? 
And here is uh, the full scale test of the brace. The buckling resident brace you just see is homemade, actually made by one doctoral student at AIT. So we actually, we, we, we didn't buy commercial product. We just make it by ourselves and we test the full scale. This is a structural engineering lab and we connect to a hydraulic actuator. So we can test it under tension, com tension, compression. Okay, you can see compare between these two. This under tension with plastic deformation is already yield and deform in tension in plastic mode. This a compression also yield and plastically deformed in compression. So we test under cyclic load from small amplitude to large amplitude. It worked very well. Okay. Now you can see here, and, and we just put just a few of them, four of them in one direction and another four in the orthogonal direction. So this count as two. We have two here and two on the back. Okay, that, that is good enough to improve, raise the seismic resistance to the acceptable level. We, we don't really need the stiffness from this brace. We actually use energy dissipation property of this brace to suppress the response. Okay, so the, the real brace is a very thin, flat, flat plate inside this block, this, this, this one. Okay, um, after we installed this one, about one year after that, I visit this school and I talked to the teacher, school teachers. They told me that school children are not happy with this brace because when they run into the, this building, they hit, knock their head with the brace. So they are very unhappy with the brace. But I, I think the school teacher did not explain to them that when earthquake strike this building, this brace will save their life. Okay, if they know that the brace will save their life, they will be more happy to live with this brace. But anyway, I, I think you can see that it does not interfere much to the, the bu building structure. These are uh, seismic retrofit techniques using BRB is commonly known in some countries, like in Japan, but it's new for Thailand for many countries in Asia. And you know, many countries in Asia are earthquake prune countries. Nepal, Indonesia, Philippines, they need to apply more of this type of uh, seismic retrofit measure to their weak existing structure. It will, it will be good for that people. It will be good for their engineers as well. Engineer has more work to do than that work is also to increase, improve the safety of uh, our people. Now I change the subject. There, there are many other um, techniques to reduce the seismic effect. And I think you may have heard about this because base isolation, okay? Instead of building the structure, fix them to the ground, we actually separate the superstructure from the substructure, the foundation system. We put um, rubber bearing in between. We call base isolation. This is how we construct them. We construct the base first, the foundation system first. We put the rubber bearing. The rubber bearing look, look, look like this. It's the same type of bearing that we use for making tune mass damper but the size is much larger, okay? Well, this type of bearing, it can carry a lot of vertical load, but it's very soft in lateral direction. So when we put the bearing between the foundation and superstructure, then the building is seismically isolated, okay? Here's an example. This is a case study building. Uh, proposed by the Department of Public Works in Thailand. They are thinking of putting some important government building 
uh, on top of this base isolation system. So they already designed this government building, but they want this building to be safe, to be able to use them, uh, to be uh, operate them, uh, use them after the earthquake. This is a kind of five-story building, large building. So I, I, this is a project work. So I give this work to one master student in AIT. Her name is Acharapan. I ask ask her to design a base isolation system for this for 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 this government building. That means underneath each column, she has to design the base isolator. So this shows the, the plan view. Okay, you can see with many different colors. Different colors mean different type of base isolation bearing. My, my request to her was to use only commercially available products. Okay, so she checked the commercially available products of base isolation bearing and picked the right size, the right properties. And he found that you need uh, five different types called group one to group five, placing on a different column, underneath uh, different columns for the entire structure. This shows some properties, but I, I have no time to go into details. Huh? This column shows the vertical stiffness of the bearing, okay? The vertical stiffness of the bearing is approximately equal to vertical stiffness of column, as in column in one story, approximately equal to axial stiffness of a column in one story. So it's, it's like you add one more floor to the building. Horizontal stiffness is much lower than vertical stiffness. KH is horizontal. If you take the ratio between KV and KH, it's about 1,000. It means that vertical stiffness is about 1,000 times of horizontal stiffness. So horizontal stiffness is much softer, much lower. The structure under bearing, this bearing is quite rigid in vertical. It's very, I mean, flexible in lateral. Okay. Now to, to demonstrate how it works, I will show you the computer simulation. This is using a nonlinear finite element program. For the fixed base first, under DBE, this is a design level earthquake, or we call design basis earthquake ground shaking. Okay. It shows how the building deform and damage under the earthquake. Of course, if in the real structure, the deformation will be not not this level we magnify the deformation about 70 times so that you can see that the, the this displacement the color show the damage if the color is yellow or green or blue the damage is low but if the color is red the damage is very high close to the collapse point so you can see that when we fix the foundation to the ground and it's subject to earthquake if you create much damage to the building. Maybe up to the level that you cannot use the, this building in the future. Okay, this, this is done by a software called Perform 3D, which allows us to make a nonlinear modeling of the building under earthquake. Now we, we show I show you the case of isolated when you put the building on top of isolation bearing. And you can see how it moves, okay? Um, still, we have some damage to the building, but the damage is not comparable to the case of fixed base. Damage is much lower. And the dis displacement is concentrated in the isolation level. This, uh, this element represents uh, the, the bearing, which move in lateral direction. Okay, actually not only the structure have less damage, non-structural component also have less damage. 
the content inside will also have less damage okay, by this, this isolation bearing. Of course, the cost will be higher when you isolate the building. But you can do it for important buildings. Okay. The application of isolation bearing, base isolation to row rise or mid rise building is, I think, is well known. But in some countries, they apply this to power buildings. This is a case example. Um, when our group research team visit Tokyo Institute of Technology, our host was Professor Kasuhiko Kasai. And he showed us the isolation bearing underneath this tall building. This is a model of uh, his tall building in his campus. They put the entire tall buildings on top of this isolation bearing. Okay, not, not a mid rise, not a low rise. This is a high rise building. So he showed us, um, he brought us down to see the isolation system underneath this tall building. But you have to know that in Japan, you know, the, the buildings, they are made from, the, the structural system is different from the system you be used in Asia. In Japan, engineers actually design their tall buildings by using the moment resisting frame system. And sometimes they use brace frame, like this, this building is a brace frame, okay, MIF, of breast frame, okay? But, but in Asia, in other countries, like in Thailand, in Philippines, in Indonesia, the lateral resisting part is not the frame, but it's a shear wall. And the frame is actually designed to carry gravity load. So we have gravity load, the frame to carry gravity load, and we have shear wall to resist lateral load. So I think, although it's interesting that the Japanese can apply this technique to their building, but to apply it to our case, we need more research. But, but to, to understand this, I think you need to understand some basic response of a building under earthquake. This is a tall building, okay? Deforming in the first mode. Uh, the building has many vibration modes. Uh, this, this slide, uh, this, this graph show lateral displacement. We swing from left to the right. This is a corresponding shear force in each story. So you can see shear force is low on the top, high at the bottom. This is overturning moment for the building in the first mode. When the lateral displacement is high, Shear force is high and moment is high. When the lateral displacement is low, then all this force is low. So they, they are all increase or decrease in the same proportion. And actually this is proportional to model co coordinate system. Okay, if you understand the model analysis, it will be just like that. It will be proportional to model coordinate of mode one. Here is a mode two. The building have many possible vibration pattern. This is a second mode. It will vibrate at shorter periods and vibrate in different shape, different pattern of shear force, different pattern of overturning moment. And this is the third one, third mode. Of course, there are many modes. This is a, just the first three mode, okay? Now, under the real earthquake, when the building is fixed to the ground, you have all this mode will be excited at the same time. And what you will see will be simply a combination of all these modes. Okay, this is a lateral displacement. This is a shear force. This overturning moment. Okay. You will see all these summing up together, mode one, mode two, mode three, mode four, up to all significant mode. Okay. So the response will look complicated. But if you look at individual mode, it looks simple. Now, when, when we, you can see this dotted line, 
on the left and on, on, on the right is show the upper bound, the, the bound of the response on the left and on the right, okay? Over the entire response time, time history. So you have an upper bound for shear, upper bound for overturning moment. This upper bound on maximum response is called seismic demand, okay? So you have seismic demand. If the demand is high and exceed the seismic capacity of the building, then you have severe damage and you may have a safety problem, okay, or serviceability problem. So you have to check this demand compared to capacity. Demand for shear, check with shear capacity. Demand for moment, check with moment capacity. Okay, or uh, displacement with displacement capacity. Okay. So with this in mind, I think we, I just, I can explain the result now. I ask um, students to work on this project, on, 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 on this topic. Uh, this is a student, Anastasia from Indonesia. She worked on to check the isolation effect to tall building with shear wall. And then her work was further improved and refined by another student called Nimala. This is from student from Nepal. Well, both of them are from earthquake prune countries. So they are highly interested in seismic response and new technique to mitigate the response. So this show you the isolation bearing. This is a result. Okay. Of course, there are many law, many results, but I can just show one of them. Okay, the red curve is a shear force with a fixed base condition, but the green one is when you put isolation bearing underneath the building. Uh, a big drop or reduction in the shear force. So with this, you may, you may even reduce the size of shear wall. Okay, this one is a story drift ratio. I, I hope you understand this. But without isolation bearing, just fixed base, the solid drift is high, but with the um, isolated base, solid drift reduced significantly. Okay, this will reduce the damage to the structure, especially the frame. It will reduce the damage to partition walls, and many non-structural components inside the building. This is a maximum floor acceleration, fixed base and isolated base, big difference. So this actually will change the, 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 the picture. The impact to contents will depend on this parameter, peak floor acceleration. So you have much less damage to isolation building. Okay, so you can see the effectiveness, uh, effectiveness of the system. So this solution may be the, the future direction for tall buildings to go in high, high seismic area. Okay, actually one of my doctoral students is now designing the real isolation bearing in Manila right now. Okay, he, he has his own um, uh, consulting firm, and he actually promoting this method in 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 Philippines now. Now this is a last topic I want to talk. It's about structural health monitoring, or we can call by this title, rapid identification of seismic damage in tall building using acceleration response time time is three. Why acceleration response time is three? Okay, this is a vibration sensor I'm talking about. It's a very compact unit sensor that we can put on inside the building. And we put this sensor, install it inside the building and we can wait for earthquakes or strong wind effect. If we, um, from this sensor measurement, from this uh, measurement by acceleration sensor, 
we may be able to tell the health condition of the structure, especially when the building is just shaken by earthquake. Right after the earthquake, people will ask, can we go back and use this building? Or we, do we need to repair this building first? It is safe to come back and occupy this building? That will be the basic question. Okay. Uh, so the idea is to install some type of sensor. And this is a, the most economic sensor we call accelerometer. And the idea is we, we don't need to install many of them. We just install at some floor. And based on this, we, we may be able to tell the structural health condition of the system. Okay, that's uh, the, the objective. So let's see the conventional approach, or we call traditional approach. The traditional approach is to base on to use this sensor to find its natural frequency, damping, or mode shape. Okay, and before it's subject to earthquake, and after it was subject to earthquake. If there is a big change in natural frequency, major increase in damping, or significant change in mode shape, then it might indicate the severe damage in the building. Okay, this is a conventional approach, but we found that this is not really effective. Even when the structure has serious damage, the change in frequency is very low. The change in mode shape is almost. Uh, it's, it's hard to see the chain in, in, in the mode shape. So we are thinking of a, a, a different way. Our approach is not to check the model property. Our approach is different. So from the acceleration sensor, we get acceleration at different floor. From this, we will extract what we call modal acceleration. And by integrating this acceleration twice, Indicate acceleration, you get velocity. Indicate velocity, you get displacement. You get model coordinate of this system. From the model coordinate, for example, Q1, you can calculate all the response produced by mode one. Either it is inter-story drift, floor acceleration, story moment, story shear, everything. Even component level respond in mode one. And for the mode two, you, from model coordinate, mode two, you can also calculate the corresponding response for mode two. And then you can sum them up and you get the total response. Okay, that is the idea. Okay, so we, we start checking this, whether this approach is implementable or not, or this is a concept, but to make sure that it works, we have to test with that real structure. So this is uh, the work by two master students in 2020 and 2021, Mr. Chananwat and Mr. Navindra. Okay, they actually have a computer model of the building. From that, they actually do some process, pass through some processing unit we call orthogonal filter. We can actually separate this respond into mode one, mode two, mode three. It's called modal acceleration. And from this modal acceleration, we can integrate twice and get modal coordinate. Okay. This, this is the idea. So based on this, we can predict other response. We measure acceleration response, but we can predict shear force. We can predict bending moment. We can predict storage drift, everything from this. So this show how accurate is our prediction. What, what you need to compare is the black curve is the real response, base tier, base moment, the black curve from direct nonlinear response history analysis. But the blue curve is those estimate from acceleration response. 
So you can see the blue curve is not far away from the black curve. It allows us to actually estimate well about the time history of this year, the time history of this moment. From this time history, we can actually estimate the upper bound, lower bound, or we can estimate seismic demand. Okay, so this is a plot of seismic demand. Again, you compare the black curve, this is, which is a real seismic demand for this building under earthquake. And the blue curve is coming from acceleration sensor. Okay, there, there are some errors, but errors is small. I think we can estimate all this seismic demand, moment demand, interstory, interstory drift demand quite in a reasonable manner. Okay, that is the idea. But if you do it in a numerical approach, not many people will believe you. So I have another student, his name is Abhishek. Um, okay, Abhishek. And he actually conduct an experiment. It's a physical experiment in his thesis. It's a, a just vertical cantilever beam with a mass lump at eight different level. So it's a multi-degree of freedom system put on check, checking table. So this, this is a closer view of uh, the, the structure. We put accelerometer. Okay, accelerometer is shown by the red dot. Uh, this is accelerometer represented by the red dot. So we put the accelerometer at the base and at some floor of this structure. And we want to use this acceleration response to predict many response inside this structure. So we, we want to check, predict bending strain. So we put a strain gauge as well for measure the bending strain. We put a diagonal strain gauge to measure the shear strain, to, which is proportional to the shear force. So we actually put all this gauge at the, near the base and near the midpoint to check the other response. Now the idea is we check this structure. We will measure acceleration response. And from the acceleration response, we want to estimate bending strain and shear strain. That is an exercise. And to confirm that we are, our estimation is correct, we have to measure them directly as well and compare with the, our prediction from acceleration response. Okay, so that, that is the work. I show you how we conduct the test. If we apply one factor, if oh, we, that's, that's a, it's like going yeah. Well, we apply the low level checking up, up to the high level checking. Okay. I think it, it was fun for the students to, to do this. So they can see the real movement, the response of structure in, 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 in real. It's a physical model test. Okay. We record all this acceleration. Uh, the student also made this video for me to demonstrate his work, uh, uh, Mr. Abhishek. So you can see here. This one is acceleration, the green one. But the red one is a strain. You can see they are look, they look entirely different. But, but what I want to share, say is that from the green color uh, data uh, response, we can predict the strain at the measurement location. Okay. The measure strain is shown in this green color. The red one is estimate from acceleration response. So they mesh well. So this, this is the last slide that to show how it works. It's a bending strain at the base, shear strain at the base, bending strain at the midpoint, shear strain at the midpoint. The red one is the, the, the measurement 
conduct directly from the model. The black curve is the one we estimate from acceleration response. So you can see that they match extremely well. It makes it very promising. So if we can estimate the response, many kind of response of the structure, bending moment, shear, shear, solid drift, and other response, we can compare this with the limit, acceptable limit. We can check the damage status of the structure at any location. Okay, I think that, that is a key idea. So we hope to be able to apply this concept in the future in the real structure. There's a team working on this to develop our, I'll say, body of knowledge to be applied to the real structure. So this is a step for this. I think that, that's all from my side. I hope uh, it doesn't, I think it takes about one hour. Okay, thank you for your kind attention. I'd like to stop here and I'm ready to answer any question or receive any of your comment. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, for a very uh, informative and very uh, detailed lecture. I would like to ask one question. Um, yeah, actually, two questions. One is, uh, have you ever, I mean, have you all measured the, the inherent damping of buildings and what is the value? Uh, the second question is, uh, your uh, diagonal bracings uh, for seismic bracings, when you are positioning, what was the criteria when you are positioning the uh, seismic bracing in this school building? Um, okay, okay. The first question is about damping. Yes. You know, in the damping, you mm -hmm. talk about which, which structure? Yeah, so generally now when we, uh, when we uh, uh, design, we we get uh, we calculate we we get about one percent inherent damping in the structure, yeah. so, but actually is that the real value or whether it's less than the real value? Have you ever uh, whether you all have uh, checked uh, the inherent damping of factors? Okay, um, the the answer is we have many techniques to check the real structural damping inherent damping. Hmm. Okay, what you assume in your design maybe it's recommended by your code or by your standards or by yeah. your guide. But if you have your structure already, mm. you can, the sensor like I show, mm. it monitor the response. Mm. It can be the natural ambient response, low level vibration. From that is to process and analyze this measurement data. You can identify mm. the inherent damping. Okay. Well, the problem is the damping will depends on response amplitude. For right. low level excitation, it has one value of damping. Mm. When you have a larger response, you may have larger level of damping. Mm. You may have to put this kind of a modern sensor system and wait for the response under typhoon or under earthquake and you get more information about your damping to confirm your assume number in your design. Okay, thank you. And uh, for buckling rest and buckling rest and brace, huh? Yeah. Okay. I think the idea is you can put it anywhere you like. Okay. Um, but we, the, the design, what we try to do is to put as minimum number of brace as much as possible. Okay. Yes, the building have many bays in X in Y, but mm -hmm. we put only four in one direction. Okay. And but we according to my, I mean, we, we, my observation, like you have, uh, you have uh, put uh, where the stiffness is higher uh, width. Um, stiffness of the brace is not the key factor. No building stiffness. Building uh, because. Uh, you think stiffness yeah, the that, wall is uh, you have put your wall. Has, yeah. the upper story has more stiffness lateral stiffness yeah, lower has stiffness mm. but but mm. we are not trying to match put the brace to match to increase the stiffness to match with the second story 
That, that is not the purpose. We put this place so that it will deform. Mm. Because the deformation will con concentrate in the first story. Mm. When the place deform, it will dissipate energy. When it dissipates energy, it will reduce the response. Mm. Okay? So if right. you look at the response spectrum curve, I think you are familiar with response spectrum. Yeah. Uh, the typical response spectrum is for 5% or 2%. Yeah. Mm. But when you put this brace, your damping will be increased to 10% or 20%. Mm. So your response spectrum curve will be drop, will drop down. Mm. Okay? That, that is yeah. the main purpose. All right? right. And part of increase uh, vibration absorption energy capacity, not, mm. not the stiffness. And, and, and if you put too much, too large brace, it, you have to mm. modify the foundation because right. it will increase the reaction load to the foundation. So right. if you put a small, small brace, mm. a few, mm. few of them, and we don't have to do anything much, and it works. Right. This has to be confirmed by a complete nonlinear response history analysis using nonlinear finite element model of structure with steel brace. Okay? Right, thank you, Roger. Hmm. Okay, and I'm open for any other questions. Uh, Professor, thank you very much for your presentation. Can I know how many modes to be considered uh, for creating the combined model seismic response? Oh, I see. This one? <laughs> yes. Actually, the typical thumb rules is you have to calculate effective mass and you have to sum all the effective mass to be about 90% of the total mass of the building. This is a thumb rule, and it's shown in many code and standard. But, but in, in reality, if you want to predict accurately the story, the structural lateral displacement or story drift, you may need only two modes, the first mode and second mode for tall building. But to get the correct shear, you may need about five modes. OK, I think. Three to five. To get the overturning moment right, I think you need about two to four modes. So actually, it varies from response to response. I cannot tell. But if you don't have any experience, you have to add more modes as you to, to, to be sure. And then you can test by removing some of them out. If the result does not change much, that means you put already enough number of modes. Okay. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Am I too fast? I mean, finish too no, soon? No. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no. Uh, when you are combining a uh, different directional uh, mode, uh, how you, uh, what is the, what is the logic that you connect uh, the, the combine those? Uh, mm -hmm. I, I think you, you can, I, I simplify my presentation so that you can see the response in one direction. But in, 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 a, in reality, when you design the system, you have to consider bi-directional excitation. Okay, you have to apply excitation both in X and in Y directly, yeah. uh, simultaneously. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sometimes this will create a, um, the bidirectional combined uh, effect. The court may say you can calculate each uh, direction separately and then combine by a certain combination rules like 100% plus 30%. But, but that's a simplified approach. If you have a complete model, then you just apply them together as a pair of ground motion. Okay? Right. In some cases, you so may have to add a vertical vertical component as well, vertical direction. So, so basically, one hundred percent in both direction. Oh. Um, uh, 
you apply simultaneously, but the effect is not, you can say 100%, yes, but it's as a time history. Right, okay. But if you combine them by consider the, the peak response, it's mm -hmm. not 100% X but 100, plus 100% Y. It's not like right. that. Right, right. Plus 30% Y, 100% X of, of the maximum. Okay. Yes. But I, I think you are familiar with this type if you do seismic, right? Seismic yes, analysis. Yes. Just yes. put them. The, the main problem of bidirectional characteristic ground motion is sometimes you put the wrong pair of ground motion. Mm -hmm. Um, the ground motion actually have, when you consider one component, it's different from you when you consider a pair of ground motion uh, components. It has a maximum direction effect and minimum direction effect. So I think this is a complicated subject we, we, we cannot discuss yeah. today. <laughs> Professor, your uh, nonlinear analysis uh, software and non, uh, non uh, the real uh, applications of uh, of uh, research work, how how uh, accurate they are the software? Uh, <laughs> uh, so software, I, I consider yeah, that we, we we depend more, very, very much on software. How how accurate they? You yeah. may be having a first hand experience. I'm not sure about that. I think it's more on how we apply the software. Mm. Software is like a platform. Yeah. Like, like this, perform 3D. Mm. You can claim that you use perform 3D. Yes. You also use a perform 3D may model plastic hinge as a lump plastic hinge, or yes. they some may use fiber model. Mm. Some may model in more details. Some uh, just make a crude model. So there's a lot of assumption and simplification we use in the, in, in the modeling. Mm. So normally when I ask my students to work on this, I, I will have, have them pass through the test. Oh. They have to model, model some small structure. Mm. And the, the computer respond with the real people. Experiment. Okay. If they cannot match their prediction with the physical experiment measurement, mm. then they cannot proceed to the next step. Correct. Okay. That, that's a normal testing set step. He said. Right. And after we go through that, then they can model the entire structure. Mm. So we have to test many design features. I mean, mm. mo modeling feature, modeling of wall, modeling of frame. Modeling yeah. of frame with brick in field wall. There are many testing steps to, to do to make sure that we model them right. I think in, in practice, you may have to adopt another measure we call peer review. Okay. Peer review. Process. When one company, design company, ad adopt a certain modeling uh, assumption. It has to be reviewed by other parties. Mm. Other party may have a different idea. Correct. Then through this discussion, we can improve our understanding. True, true. All right? Yes, thank you, Rob. In, in my, my, my case, uh, I basically use Perform 3D. Actually, I never use Perform 3D myself. Most of my students are using that. Some um, advanced students use uh, OpenSea, which is open okay. platform. In the past, some of them use Romoco. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I'm a Buddhika here. Can I ask uh, some questions? Yes, of course. Uh, yeah, th thank you uh, for your presentation, uh, Professor. Uh, I, I have one one question regarding this uh, the previous discussion you had uh, uh, 
uh, this regarding uh, the calculation of uh, like base shear in uh, buildings mm. uh, now the current uh, trend globally in uh, practice is that we use number of modes and uh, the, calculate the elastic demand and uh, to estimate that we divide by a particular factor that is uh, based on the code based design uh, but uh, now there is a recent trend uh, in uh, the design where uh, people uh, differentiate uh, the, there is two different types of uh, factors uh, that is for first mode uh, the factor is uh, the response modification factor is different than higher modes so mm -hmm. what uh, what type of idea that you are having uh, regarding you know moving to that type of uh, practice uh, uh, when we estimate the uh, design uh, shear in particular okay uh, thanks for this my question. first question yes yes sir. that that is also one of the uh, research topic uh, we are working at at as well you know like like this we have a first mode second mode third mode and we can combine them into total response. This is uh, actually valid for elastic, okay? But when you design, perform seismic design, you allow building to have some damage. So you have some reduction factor due to inelastic in effect. So if you apply what you call response spectrum procedure, after you combine first mode, second mode, third mode, and other mode, you will divide it all respond by one factor called R factor. We found that that, that approach is, is not correct. Okay. If we are able to compute respond in first mode, second mode, third mode, when the structure is nonlinear, you will find that the reduction effect is mainly can be applied to the first mode. But high, higher modes remain more or less elastic. Okay. So the idea is the first mode. Can you see my writing? Yes. Yes, sir. yes. You can divide it by R. Plus higher mode mean elastic. Uh, higher mode. Okay no reduction. This is uh, the, the right way. It's um, actually this is square and square, square root square sum. Okay. So yes. basically you, you, you should apply R factor, whatever the court say, just to the first mode. But that R factor should not apply to the higher mode. So what I'm saying is, Response spectrum analysis procedure we used to follow in the past is not correct. Yes. Mm -hmm. So in Thailand, we actually modify this response spectrum procedure. We call it modified response spectrum. So our we apply R only for the first mode, and we assume higher mode elastic. We already correct that in our code and standard. Yeah. Right. Uh, thank you, Professor. I, I think uh, our practice is still. Uh, what I want to say another thing is, yeah. you, you can actually check the real shear if you perform nonlinear response spectrum and uh, time time history analysis procedure. If you perform this, you see the real shear. Okay, the real response. Okay, but if you Perform RSA. This is a, a, a simplified one. This is more, more uh, realistic, more reliable. Okay. But to, to get the nonlinear response history analysis, you need to have accurate nonlinear model of the structure 3D. All right. It will be take long time, no, to do the total landing. <laughs> yes, yeah. professor. Now, uh, my it question is, time, but but the difference will be, sometimes you get this here, and mm. this here, mm. and this can be actually much less than this. Mm. Uh -huh. 
sometimes it's less than 30% of this one. So you, you may design your wall with a very low figure shear, mm. much less than the real shear developed in your wall. So make your design unsafe. Mm. Okay. So of course we, we know that RSA is easy and not so time consuming, but this one is very time consuming. Mm. And, but, but this is more, more accurate. So we come up with some solution, MIS, MRSA, somewhere in, in, in between. Right. Something like I say, but we define R factor. Yeah. yeah so not only what we do is, uh, Professor, uh, we do. Uh, we include the modification, um, reduce uh, uh, modification factors to reduce the stiffness, and then we apply the uh, apply the uh, response spectrum with the with the uh, ductile, uh, dividing the ductile factor, and then we see the drift and 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 try to see what is the performance of the the building under uh, design earthquake. Um. I'm not sure that this approach is the right one, hmm. but you, you know, um, okay. Uh, yeah, the, the, quite complicated. We have a number of papers on, on this issue. So I, I can send, send you some, but it's maybe difficult right. to read. Yeah. Yeah, Professor, can I uh, again know, uh, so to, to move from the conventional response spectrum analysis to modified response spectrum analysis in uh, Thailand, uh, what sort of things that you have done? Because now we are following a particular code of practice uh, when we design buildings. So normally we adhere to that, but modified response spectrum analysis is not what is uh, directly done. Because we follow coding uh, like either Australian code, or oh, Eurocode uh, for practice uh, in Sri Lanka. Uh, uh, okay, I, I what think. What is your recommendation? In, um, how, do you, how do you blend uh, into this? <laughs> in some code, they use this one, which is, for example, for, for shear. The design shear is somewhere around sum of V1, where plus V2, plus V1 and square root and then decide by divided by r okay. and modify response spectrum and uh, no in this one some correct that by multiplying this design by two factor or strength factor and dynamic amplification factor this is a sce7 approach okay and in Europe, maybe they lump this into one factor. In some countries, yes. But I think the more accurate one should be something like uh, VD equal to V1 by R squared plus V2. No reduction. Okay, something like this. Yeah. And we have that presented in our standard. And the point is when engineer look at this and they calculate the shear, they found that this MRSA shear is much greater than this conventional RSA shear. Yeah. And they're not happy. Okay. They think yeah. that <laughs> the new <laughs> that is wrong. So we told them not to believe us, but believe in this one, NLIHA. And you will find that NLIHA is close to this one. Mm -hmm. It's quite different from this one. So if they do it by themselves, they will know. But yeah. since not many, not many design firms fall, apply this NLIHA because it's very time consuming and effort consuming. Yeah? You need an expert to do that. So no one can check this one. So only a few know. So we, we are, it's quite difficult to change the practice. 
Oh uh, yeah, to, uh, some resistance from from Thai design engineers. <laughs> So in the nutshell, uh, Professor, you are saying uh, that uh, if you use MRSA, uh, mm. then uh, in the place of RSA, uh, in MRSA, we sh should give us a kind, a kind of a larger interstory drift, right? Uh, no, actually, this Maybe, is for uh, But you will see that uh, displacement and uh, drift mainly governed by the first mode. Yes. The second mode drift, third mode drift is low. Mm. Ah. So even you use the formula, the wrong formula, still you are not off too much. So you still can mm. apply the same formula of I okay. predict the drift and so on. Okay. Uh, can, can I ask one, one more question? I have simple. Uh, uh, Professor, now uh, when when we when you use the uh, uh, introduce these buckling resistant braces, mm -hmm. the building, I have seen you have modified uh, a por portion of the beam to accommodate the uh, you know uh, uh, you know kind of to fix this particular ga gadget right uh, now. For an example, slide twenty five. Yeah, you you have a very sharp eyes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Okay. Yeah, so uh, I, I was wondering like uh, once we do such kind of modification, won't it, uh, uh, you know, change this uh, strong column weak beam phenomena that we used in uh, engineering? So how do you uh, just uh, ensure that uh, uh, there is no local failures, uh, you know, doing such modification? I, I just saw it just. No, I, actually, I, I, I work this uh, one this project with many of my colleagues and we found that the frame and column beams are normally stronger than the columns okay you, you have uh, the span like this huh? then the span actually control the size of the beam and mm -hmm. the column we normally use is small because the number of story is just two so the size of column is not large. So we cannot keep strong column weak beam principle. So most, most of them design for strong beam weak column, which is not right, but it's everywhere. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah. So the damage will actually concentrate in a column. Yeah, OK. Not, not, not in a beam, OK? But when you put, um, so we are actually put the brace not to lock to the column, but lock to the beam because beam is stronger. Now, my colleagues actually think that the existing beam size will be too small. When you have this concentrated force, it will produce additional, additional shear load near the beam column joint. So he just enlarged this portion because he worried about that. Okay, we actually enlarge the foundation beam as well. Okay, but, but that is just a small modification. The main point is we don't have to modify, um, I would say, the, the foundation system, the foundation mm -hmm. as well. We don't have to dig the ground and modify that because the additional, additional shear load is, is not much. You can go with that, okay? If we have to modify the foundation pad or add more pies, it will take cost more, cost, cost much more. Okay, yeah, th th thank you, yeah, I understood, yeah. Yeah, it, since we talk about this one, huh, I want to say a little bit, if you okay. take the cross section, it will look like this. The, the, the real, the real brace is a flat plate, but it's surrounded by this still uh, rectangular section column. And we fill this with the uh, cement ground, but cement ground is not bonded to the plate inside. Okay. So the real brace is actually very small. So the outer one needs to prevent the buckling? 
The other one is to bring the backing. Correct. Okay. Right. Yeah. Thank you very much, Professor. Yeah. Sir, I'm Rohit here, sir. <laughs> ah, okay, Rohit. Yes, so the, uh, because you touch base uh, a lot about the, the buildings, would you be able to give some, uh, 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 I know that you don't have slides with you, but a bit about the the, the wind engineering applications in the cable stabilizers that you used to taught us when we were students. Uh, oh. Yeah. Okay. Uh, would you be able to just explain something like in the cable stay bridges, for example, and suspension bridges, the how important the wind engineering is? Uh... Oh, wow. I, I, I did not prepare that, but I, I can look for the slide now. Mm, let me see. Well, I think you, you should have told me. Um, <laughs> yeah, really sorry about it. Yeah. And, and then I will add into the scope of a presentation. You may assume that I will add that into the slide, right? So, yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. Let me see. Well, I, I don't have it now. It takes time to, to find, but I think uh, maybe just a comment that, um, you know, for cable support structure, like cable stay bridge or cable sus a suspension bridge, we actually need a lot of vibration control device. We may need both um, aerodynamic approach, modifying the shape of the girder, modify the shape of pylon to make the structure stable. We may need to put viscous damper to add damping to the cable to prevent cable vibration. We may have to add to mass damper inside the girder just to enhance energy dissipation capacity of the bridge. Now, there's a lot of work, a lot of um, reason to put all this vibration control device into this uh, long span cable support structures. Okay, because the structure itself is quite flexible. The structure is large, so it has low damping. So it's quite vulnerable to dynamic wind effect. But of course the dynamic wind effect is, there are many types of dynamic wind effects. What I present in this, in this Seminar is just one type, it's called vortex induced vibration. There are many other types like a galloping or torsional flutter and many others, or rain induced vibration. That's the, the big subject area. Rohita may have learned about this if you still can remember. <laughs> but I, it's not a subject I can present right, right now, right here. I need to prepare. Yeah, but what I, I want to show today is just the application, different application for different problems. But maybe I didn't highlight the bridge structure. Becca, maybe pay attention more to the bridge structure, right? Uh, yes, uh, yeah. Uh, the, the other uh, the things that you like, uh, I think the all uh, structural engineers, we just uh, follow the guidelines in the code. For example, uh, if I may just share the experience that we are using in the Australian standard. So the uh, uh, the design, we use the like the, the, the spectral, the spectral shape, the, the, we get the, the seismic hazard factor and the, that DZ and then according to the, uh, the performance requirement, uh, we multiply that one by probability factor, for example, like uh, 
if a bridge or any structure is required serviceable or damage control, all this uh, according to the conditions. Uh, my understanding is I think the seismic hazard factors uh, develop for one in 500 year return period, like we go like one in 2000 uh, in ultimate uh, the, the, the performance requirement higher certain bridges. So then we multiply by KP factor by 1.7 and then the we get the the we look at the design code, give the designers the guidance to use the ductility factor. I think that's the based on how ductile is the structure. For example, the one like uh, when we use for uh, the one in my background for industrial ring road, that is the moment frame structure. So ductility is quite higher. But the other bridges in general, we use the bridges uh, sitting on the elastomeric pairing. Their ductility is uh, quite low. If I give the numbers in the code, like a four versus 1.5. So we combine them together and put in the, the spectral shape factor. And then we apply that one into the our the system and we analyze it. Uh, so the, uh, because the, the, the performance of the bridge, because it's a less elements the compared to the, the behavior and the modes is compared to the building is much less. And uh, uh, like, I want to uh, get your opinion. So like uh, we get the simple, the bridge structures and we go to the complex bridge structures, the, this design approach using the code, uh, do you think at which point we need to grow from like a one level to another level or just deviate from the code and go to a <laughs> no, you, you, very high level of analysis? Rohita, I, I cannot answer that question right now, but I know that, you know, the building code is different from the bridge design code. Yes. Sir. They may different in, in the details. Yeah. Basic principles the same. Yeah. Okay. But even you look at the building code, you look at American code, the Japanese code, European code, they are so also different. When we talk about seismic design, the code 10 years ago also different from the code today. Yes. It keeps changing all the time. Yeah. So you you should not be surprised if, if it's changing very fast. The, but the one that stay is uh, the, the basic concept are always the same. Okay, except we learn something new. All right. And normally the practicing code uh, actually translate from new research finding as well. The research studies brought the practical problem into the research. They study this. They find a new solution or new way of doing this, and it, then it translate that into the guidelines. The guidelines then turn into a standard. Okay, this uh, the process continue. So I I cannot answer the the the, the questions like <laughs> that. Yes. Yeah. Um, but the main point is I think if we keep uh, checking the new research like what we discussed now, modified response spectrum, response spectrum, you will see that some of the past practice are not right. And we need to modify that. Sometimes they, they give a different, not just a few percent, but it's give them the, the different, just maybe as, as much as three, four times in a number. So the understanding change, the practice will change in the future. I, I, I do not work much in practice. I work in the research, but I know that my research, some of my research will be translated in the practice. In Thailand, I'm, I'm a code writer, but I always been received many complaints from practicing engineers. They do not like my idea. So, uh, sometimes I have to convince them. Sometimes they have to convince me. Okay, so we work together. 
Uh, but the, the main, main point is our, our structural engineering practice and knowledge are not static. They are dynamic. They keep changing. That's all I can say now. Thank you, sir. Uh, can I ask one more question, Professor? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Th this is regarding this. Uh, the, when you discuss about these different types of uh, an analysis, uh, now I, I found uh, you discuss about this uh, uh, base isolation building and so on. Uh, there, uh, you have uh, discussed about this uh, maximum directional spectrum. Or oh, uh, uh, you know, when you do bidirectional analysis. Now, like A, B, C code, as uh, I remember, that you have to uh, you know rotate the ground motion and uh, apply to the building until uh, you find out the, the maximum uh, directional response. So, what 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 sort of things that uh, you do in uh, practice when it comes to especially tall buildings? Now, uh, because uh, the max, how do you find out the maximum directional response? Either it is by using the response uh, triangle, you know, equivalent static method. So, are you implementing dynamic analysis method? Hmm. Well, the the question is getting more and more advanced. <laughs> <laughs> That's make me. It's, it's quite difficult for me now. Okay, let let me say this one. If you follow American code SCE, huh? they uh, actually follow the concept of MCE, okay? Maximum credible earthquake. And if you multiply this by two thirds, you have this as design basis earthquake. Now, in SCE 7 version 16, they introduced the concept of MCE. It's a risk target. So you have to modify by risk coefficient and you have to look at the maximum direction spectrum, not component X spectrum or component Y spectrum, but the maximum direction spectrum. That means you have to consider the ground motion as by directions. Yes. <laughs> and uh, so you have ground motion X and Y. Apply together, your maximum response may not be in X, may not be in Y, but in somewhere in between. And that may, may be in this direction. That's a response will occur in theta direction compared to X, okay? Now you talk about tall buildings. Tall buildings have many vibration modes. So some mode in period one, Maximum direction may be in certain angle. Mode two may be in another angle. Mode three in another angle. So this is getting more complicated, huh? right? Maximum direction. So actually, the key to this is to choose the pair of ground motion in the right way. Okay, you have to choose the pair of ground motion from the real earthquake record. So if you have correct by directional characteristic. But in practice, you may, you may have to modify this to fit with your spectrum. When you modify it to fit with your spectrum, you may apply spectral matching, okay? Mm -hmm. But if you do not apply the right spectral matching, it will destroy this by directional characteristic. If you apply it right, if you keep this bidirectional property of the ground motion, right? That is a complicated issue. <laughs> I don't think we can discuss this yeah. now. But it's very important to pick the right ground motion. It's very important to modify them by the right process so that you can use them in the calculation with correct meaning and correct uh, reliability. And after you have the right input, then you can design based on your response properly. That's all I can say now. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you, Professor. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. Okay.
Okay, uh, the question is much more advanced than the scope of my presentation. Uh, yeah, that, that, sorry, sir. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I make an estimate too low. I think you, you require more advanced level of um, story. No, sir, I understood. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. I hope I an answer all the questions properly. Yeah, if uh, if if the audience, uh, I think if you do not have any more questions, like I will ask invite uh, Shiromal to to do a word of thanks. Yeah, uh, on behalf of the audience, I would like to uh, uh, thank uh, Pulsa and. Uh, for an excellent presentation and very informative uh, uh, information and the research uh, uh, knowledge that he has shared with the audience. And also the uh, question conversation was also very uh, active. It shows uh, the, the importance of the lecture and the, uh, the, uh, the discussion was very fruitful. And uh, I would also like to thank uh, engineer uh, Rohita Silva, who organized this lecture, which is very important. Uh, that uh, very important that uh, this uh, uh, the eminent professor like Paul Penan is introduced to us, our audience, and uh, we are grateful to you, uh, Rohita, for organizing all that. And thank you very much for all the uh, participants who, uh, which uh, made the whole. Uh, presentation uh, uh, worthwhile uh, and fruitful. Thank you. Thank you, Pauza. Thank you, Rohit. I, I, I would like to thank you also, to all of you, to have a very good attention and also for asking very many interesting questions. I think uh, questions uh, will help me also to think about this in the future. Okay, I hope I can Next time we will invite you to come to Sri Lanka, you know, for a, <laughs> a live presentation. All right. <laughs> next and time, take you around, uh, <laughs> next, next, and take you around Sri Lanka to show all the cultural cities and kind of thing. Okay. We'll have a good good time here. When are you free, Professor? When when when, when what are, what is your free time, son? Um. Actually, I'm working from home almost all the time. Yeah. And I'm free all the time. Right. But um, the problem is COVID. Yeah. Uh, international travel will come back to a normal. Correct. Maybe Correct. It can come back to normal if you go to new normal. Yes. So when, when everything settles, uh, we will invite you to Sri Lanka and have a good time here with our audience. Yeah, it will, it will be, I will be happy to do that. <laughs> thank you, Professor. Thank you, Rohita, and thank you all. Okay. Thank you very much. Savadikap, sir. Savadikap, Savadikap. Thank you very much. Thank you.